We're going to go ahead and get started if you want to find a seat. And welcome to the Arts Technical Committee's presentation for the 2012 conference on making the case why audio preservation can't wait. I just returned this past week from Europe where the working group at Indiana University was visiting a couple of institutions who have done digitization on a massive scale, particularly the Netherlands Institute of Sound and Vision and ENA in France. It's the National Audiovisual Institute that's located in Paris. ENA, by the year 2015, will have digitized all of its radio and television collections. That's one and a half million hours of content that has been preserved in about a 15 year period. They're not waiting. We think there are some pretty compelling reasons why we sh in the US should not wait as well. And that's what we want to explore in this session. What we want to do is provide you with some language some arguments and some ideas that you can use to make the case within your own institution, with your own administration, with your own faculty, whoever is involved, whoever your stakeholders are. That, that's our aim. So the format here is going to be a series of short presentations. There'll be five of them, one after another. After which, we'll, have, um, we'll call upon some other members of the technical committee for comments, have a little bit of a discussion, and then we really hope that you will have questions and even, even challenge us on some of the points that we make. That would be absolutely fine. And we'll respond to those questions and kind of enlarge the discussion towards the end. So that's the basic plan. So towards that end, um, what I'm going to do is introduce everybody first so that when we get to the short presentations, we can just zip right through them, which I think will have more impact and be a little more efficient use of our time. So speaking up here, over the course of about the next um, 50 minutes will be myself. My name's Mike Casey. I'm the Director of Media Preservation Services for the Media Preservation Initiative at Indiana University. We will also have Patrick Feaster, who's also at Indiana University. Patrick's a researcher and educator specializing in the history and culture of sound media, a two-time Grammy nominee and co-founder of FirstSounds.org. He received his doctorate in folklore and ethnomusicology in 2007 from Indiana University Bloomington, where he is also a lecturer in the Department of Communication and Culture, a member of our Media Preservation Initiative, and an instructor for the School of Continuing Studies. We will have up here Marco Suedo, a senior archivist at WNYC New York Public Radio Archives in New York City. His other work includes mastering and restoring the Jackie Kennedy interviews with Arthur Schlesinger Jr. and the translation into Spanish of the audio preservation text Yaza TC04. I can tell you I'm very familiar with TC04. That's a monumental work that Marcos has, has not only undertaken but completed. He developed AVDB at Columbia University and has uh, mastered a number of releases at MasterDisc for the Alan Lomax Archives in Drag City. Also speaking will be Chris Lucinic, the founder of Audiovisual Preservation Solutions, a consulting firm that works internationally with many organizations including the Library of Congress, Carnegie Hall, Museum of Modern Arts, Stanford University on overcoming the challenges to preservation and access of legacy and file-based collections. Chris, as many of us know, used to be at Vidipax, where he was the um, vice president and the CTO, and for many years served as an adjunct professor in uh, New York University's Moving Image Archiving and Preservation Master's Degree Program. That's four, and the fifth is George Blood, who is the uh, president or and owner of George Blood Audio and Video, a leading vendor in our field. Many of you know George. He'll be speaking last. So we're going to start with our short presentations, covering a range of topics from degradation to obsolescence, to making arguments, to assessing research and instructional value. And we'll see where that takes us. Marcos is first.
Where is it? Is that it? Good afternoon, uh, Mike. Thank you for the introduction. We're going to speak about degradation, and I'm going to punch right in. Sound recordings are traditionally divided into two components, the physical item, called carrier, and the information encoded within, called the content. When sound archivists speak of degradation, we generally speak of content degradation. Now, the idea of content, uh, what content is, has expanded through the years, but we currently think of content as the signal encoded in the carrier, be it magnetic, electrical, optical, or a different type. Signal degradation as the inverse of signal integrity has been thoroughly studied in the telecommunications industry, but the concern is signal integrity across space. In audio archiving, we are concerned with signal integrity across time. When quantifying signal degradation, the telecommunications industry lists several quantities, among them attenuation distortion, phase shift, level changes, and various types of noises. Each of these measures also describes most of the types of content degradation found in sound archives. However, in sound archive, we rely mostly on anecdotal evidence of long-term signal degradation. This is partly due to the complication and expense that a rigorous study of this kind would incur. Carrier degradation is closely linked to signal degradation and is often the only way we can infer signal degradation. It may be useful to think of two types of degradation, gradual and incidental. This more or less corresponds to the medical definitions of chronic versus acute illnesses. Gradual degradation refers to natural irrevocable sign, uh, sorry, irrevocable signal loss. In most cases, signal degradation of this type is closely linked to carrier degradation due to what preservationists call inherent vices. These inherent vices limit the long-term signal integrity contained in them, even in the best conditions, and of course conditions are very important. The carriers currently thought to be most endangered for this reason are analog lacquer discs, recordable optical discs, and hard drives. Of course, all carriers have some sort of inherent vice that limits their longevity. It's like the old sad joke, life is a terminal illness. On the other hand, incidental degradation refers to an episodic change due to an external force. For example, someone spills coffee on a tape. Certain carriers are more susceptible to damage by external forces. For example, cylinders are much more prone to breakage than vinyl discs. And cylinders are also considered among the most endangered carriers for this reason. I don't know if you can see that, but uh, also got a, a bit about detection of degradation. There's two ways, uh, via non-playback detection and via playback detection. Without playback, detection of signal degradation can be very difficult. It can be achieved in one of three ways from sensory evidence of carrier degradation, for example, you see the record is scratched, uh, from previous knowledge, for example, knowing that a brand of tape from a certain year is usually defective, or from digital error monitoring, for example, uh, by checking your checksums. There have been no systematic studies of correlations between carrier degradation symptoms and signal degradation, so we have to go by anecdotal evidence. Over decades, the sound archiving profession has accumulated much anecdotal evidence, but a scientific study correlating symptoms of carrier degradation with specific types of signal degradation would be very valuable indeed. Now, for playback detection, uh, it can also be tricky. It is usually impossible to know signal integrity at the time of the original recording, so we are missing a baseline against which to compare the current quality of the recording. In other words, if something does not sound good now, it may be due to how it was recorded originally. However, although it may be difficult to ascertain the particular reason for an individual recording's apparently faulty sound, assessing several recordings can give us enough statistical points to establish correlations between sensory clues and playback problems. For example, if only recordings uh, in our collection done in a particular brand of cassette are squeaky, we may start to think that the problem is with the tape and not the original recording. There's also other clues that engineers usually know. But, um, and this is akin to what epidemiologists do when studying disease in populations. Unfortunately, rigorous studies of this sort in our field are very rare. And here are some uh, t usual types of degradation for common sound carriers. At the risk of pushing the medical analogy too far, I have expanded the medical analogies to the other columns. Particularly in danger carriers and their most common ailments are highlighted in yellow. So cylinder like a disc, optical disc, and hard drive. Now 
now let's talk about the interaction, interaction of, of degradation resources and time. Preservation means nothing without access, and that implies retrieving a signal. Three factors affect the integrity of a retrieved signal. Integrity of the stored signal itself, resources, and historical point in time. As we have seen, signal integrity decreases over time and is often linked to carrier integrity. Below is a hypothetical crude example of signal integrity of a CDR over time. Measure as inverse of number of uncorrectable errors. So the errors get more frequent, so integ signal integrity goes down. One can also plot resources over signal integrity. The more resources applied, the more accurately the signal can be retrieved. Although the assumption is that one can never retrieve the signal with full integrity, increased quote unquote effort will bring you tantalizingly close. And here's a representation of this idea as a graph. Plotting the evolution of resources over time is a bit trickier. If T0 is the point at which a format is introduced and P the point in its history of peak popularity, uh, the resources necessary to retrieve a signal may generally follow a curve such as the one below. This curve uh, could plot, for example, the inverse of the number of available playback devices, which generally mimics the availability of resources necessary to playback a particular format. The factor we're interested in is actually the difference between available resources and the curve shown here. Note that given a certain level of available resources, extracting the signal may become impractical in the future. This is not because the signal is intrinsically diminished in quality, but rather because it's more difficult to extract. And we'll talk about later um, about uh, uh, obsolescence. At one point, it either becomes impractical to extract the signal, or you need to allocate more resources to extract it. So that's one argument to make. An interesting exercise is to combine all these factors in one graph to get a sense of the integrity of the signal extracted at a certain point in time with a certain budget. One could think of the extracted signal as a multiplication of all three graphs that we've mentioned represented graphically here. The graph here shows the signal extracted from a hypothetical carrier at two points. First, when the format was recorded at its peak of popularity, and then today, long after the format had disappeared from the market. Giving a predetermined resource level, which is that red line, um, two things are conspiring against the sound archivist of today. One, signal integrity has diminished, so the height of that shape is lower. Um, and the effort necessary to extract it has increased, so we have less of a room, a wiggle room there. Uh, the signal extracted is represented by the shaded areas. And it is evident that with the same resources, we can extract far less signal today than we could at the time of peak popularity of, of that format. You are getting far less bang for the buck. Since this is the trend for any format, it stands to reason that delaying signal extraction amounts to a less effective use of resources. However, all these predictions are not yet quantified. We need to establish a solid basis to estimate long-term signal extraction. We stand at an interesting point in time as there are several mass audio digitization projects around the world whose metadata could act actually be used to establish a solid basis for our path moving forward. And it is our hope that it will be so. Until then, our knowledge of content degradation will come only from anecdotal evidence. Thank you. Next up is Chris Lesenik, who will talk about obsolescence. Thank you, Marcos. Well, did you say life is a long-term illness? Is that what you're? Terminal. Did terminal illness? That's a, I thought mine was a bummer, but yours was. <laughs> man. No, I love that. Thank you. Let's see, full screen mode. All right, that works. So I'm just going to dive right in. Uh, first thing I wanted to mentioned is that what we often think of, or maybe not we in this room, but what is often thought of in general um, about obsolescence, the first thing that comes to mind is about equipment availability, right? So people typically think of if it's either commercially available or you can go on eBay and find something that it is not uh, obsolete, or many people hold this, this type of uh, rationale. Um, EASA TC04, uh, puts it this way uh, and, and talks about obsolescence, by the way, which it says almost all, and I would emphasize the all part of that as opposed to almost all, uh, of the mechanical recordings which they cover in TCO4 
are considered uh, obsolete. But, but it, it positions it in such a way in which it says, you know, it says that this has to do with the in industry which once created it, uh, supporting it. So I think the, the key word in that is, is support. Um, and the industry which created it, I, get, I think you could, you know, there's some wiggle room in there to talk about that. But, but what, I think what we want to answer here is what does support mean? Um, so, you know, I think that what we need to consider is really a, a whole range of things. Uh, it's not just whether the equipment is available or not. Um, for those of you that are on and read the ARSC list serve, uh, there's been quite a lively discussion about uh, bench technician expertise for working on open reel decks, right? So that's up here, uh, technician expertise. And, and guess what? That, that technician actually needs tools, and they're specialized tools. It's not something you go to Home Depot and pick up. It's, these are, are specialized tools, and they need things like calibration and alignment tapes, also specialized. And when these things start going away, um, in, in many ways, it doesn't matter how expert or how available an expert is. They don't have the tools that they need to do the job. So we start to see lots of things like purchasing from even what you know what can be considered the most reputable sources. Uh, you purchasing equipment, and 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 maybe getting less than well, definitely getting less than what we would have years ago. Not because they care less or are doing a bad job, but they just don't actually have the tools to do things like proper alignment and calibration of equipment. Um, so, so this whole, you know, so we have operator expertise, tech, which is which is uh, something that we see uh, more and more, right? As 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 time goes on, uh, there are less and less people that know how to really work with uh, tape machines and and discs and do the proper alignment and calibration, not from a bench tech perspective, but simply to get the proper and faithful reproduction from a recording. Um, we see the used equipment availability on, you know, and looking at eBay, which I tried to get historic data on that, which you can, but I couldn't get it together for this. Uh, you know, clearly, I'm sure we all know that, that over the past five years, and certainly over the past 10 years, there has been, one, a lot less availability, and two, it's gotten a lot more expensive. Three, I would venture a guess and say that what you actually get when you pay is less bang for the buck than what you got uh, years ago. Um, a very important one, certainly for the people in this room, is the activity of the community which surrounds the actual technology, uh, a really key indicator. When these, when these communities um, lessen in their activity levels and interest and investment, um, there's a really, you know, the knowledge bank goes away. Um, so this is akin to institutional knowledge and, and, and everything that's not documented, all these really important things that or in the brains of people that are in this room and are at this conference, there's lots of that that doesn't exist outside of our heads. And, and that, when that goes away, that's a really big loss. Um, so I'm not gonna go through all of these. I think you get the gist. There's a lot of, a lot of things. But this is not an on-off switch, right? These things are, um, take place, uh, they have a place and a time. So context, uh, it's not about is there a new audio cassette deck available. Yeah, we could actually go and purchase a new audio cassette deck. It's, it, the context here is can we get one that actually lives up to the, to the challenge of preservation and archiving, the thing that we're concerned with. When we think about authenticity and integrity and faithful reproduction, um, it's not just availability, it's about are the right things available. Um, and when we think about, there's a conversation that often takes place about, uh, I think, you know, can we leverage our community to incentivize a manufacturer to produce something that a reproducer or some, you know, tapes or tools or, or things of that nature uh, to help combat obsolescence? Uh, and the question underlying that is, well, is there a real legitimate business case? Um, and, and that's a really challenging question. And, and I think the fact that we don't see a lot of people doing this is a pretty good indicator of the answer to that question. Um, complexity is another thing we talk about. Well, it's a lot easier to reproduce a disc. All you need is a, you know, something, something that can do, act like a stylus than it, than, as opposed to a, a, a head on a tape machine. And, and while that's true, I think what we're thinking about here, one, again, authenticity and integrity. Two, in the presence of a strong business case, the difference in investment and in dealing with those levels of complexity is really very little. And, 
And, and three, we're talking about a large scale. I mean, if we think about individual things, yeah, all right, so we could piece some, someone could potentially piece something together and get a sound off of something. But, but we're not talking about one thing. We're talking about millions of hours of recordings at this point, uh, which are, have not been digitized or, nor preserved. <clears throat> um, so, and I think it's important to look at uh, uh, cost, obviously, as, as time goes on, the cost associated with doing these things, as Marcos talked about, goes up. Um, and, and, and that's a major factor to, to resource challenge organizations. Uh, the single source, we're seeing, that's also, it's not, so it's not just is it available or is it not available, but how many sources are there for these things? We, we have a lot of single source things for equipment and, and and things like uh, styli and, and, and tape machines and MRLs and things of this nature, if it's not single source, it's double source. And so we have very, you know, we have a single point of failure and a single point of dependency in those. We're, we're walking on a much thinner line now than we were years ago as far as the, the risk associated with losing that one source. So to, to put some other terms around it, these are, this is a, a timeline, or a, it looks at, kind of what are the steps, and this actually is documented in the Indiana University Bloomington Media Preservation Survey report, uh, the first report that was issued uh, after the survey was done. And, and, it, and it kind of says, what are the steps to obsolescence? And more or less, you could argue some of these might slip in before others, but, but more or less, it's the end of manufacturing is, is the first, right? So there's the production line has stopped on a particular piece of technology. Um, and again, this may be in scale, it may, it may, there may be one person still making uh, a, a playback device, but, but when there were 20 and we go to one, that's, that's, a, pretty, that's a pretty notable event. Um, availability in the commercial marketplace goes away. Bench tech expertise starts to go away. They move on to other things where salaries are higher or, 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 the, or expert go into other fields or whatever the case may be. The actual bench technician tools go away. Calibration alignment. This says tapes, but we can think of discs, cylinders, anything that anything that you you, you can put up in, on a reproducer, parts and supplies. Uh, so we just saw Brandon Burke, if he's in the room, bought the last uh, bunch of tape boxes recently from all the suppliers that were out there selling them. There was a big discussion on ours, and I needed those boxes, so I was not happy when I saw that post. <laughs> um, Availability in the used marketplace dwindles or gets extraordinarily expensive, and, and of course the playback expertise. And so, you know, I just have the list of formats on the side. That these are the things when we when we can. These are the formats that you know when we think in our mind. If we think about a chart, we would we would pretty quickly get to a point where we see that all of these formats are very far down this path when we take into consideration uh, the previous two slides and put these metrics against it. This is also out of the Indiana University Bloomington uh, report, and this, this does in some ways kind of puts it into table-like form and says, okay, here's formats um, and, and risk factors, and, and this encompasses a lot of the things that we're talking about throughout this session, deterioration, as well as obsolescence and, and other issues. Um, if you notice, so most of those are in red. I, I personally would put open reel tape in red myself as well. I, I think. Uh, it's arguable that audio cassette may be the only one uh, up there for obsolescence, recordable CD, and audio cassette. I would argue that all of those other ones are very high risk, uh, based on on everything that I've said. So this is a slide that I'm not here just to be a bummer and rain on the Arsk parade. <laughs> I think because the, the, the question is, well, so what, right? The, this, all right, doom and gloom, yeah, everything sucks. We're, we're in a bad situation. And I think actually, you know, there's a lot of heart in this community and, and oftentimes what we talk about are, and we end up in these technical committee meetings or on listservs and there's lots of good ideas about things we should do, right? We should pull resources, we should leverage the collective budget of the community to try to get things that we need. Um, we, we should create resources. We should identify who's out there that, ha that is serving this community that has this equipment and we should support them. There's lots of, lots of great ideas and in, and, and in some way those all fit under the umbrella of kind of risk mitigation. Um, but that alone is not enough. We, 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 one, I think 
how many, if we look at, all, out of all the good ideas we've had, and I put myself in this group, how many have we actually done? I'm not gonna answer that question. Uh, but, but also, I, I think they're great ideas. I think in, in an ideal world, we would, we would be doing them, uh, and, and it still wouldn't be enough if we got all of them done. The reality is, is, is that we need to take a multifaceted approach, and, and a really core part of that is, is actually getting to digitization. Now, if we talk, one of the, 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 the number that was thrown out, I think, by Mike for this presentation at the beginning was 15 years. I think that is very, very generous. I, I don't think it's 15 years. I think it's 10 or less until we get to a point where we, we have major issues with being able to preserve um, content. And, and guess what? As we all know, there's a lot we have to do before we can get to digitization. We have to gain intellectual control. We have to be able to plan. We have to be able to budget. We have to be able to do lots of things uh, before we can get to digitization and make sure that we have an effective allocation of resources. So, um, but but the main the main point being is that we need to take action. We have to start down that path now because we, as much as we've been saying it for many years that we don't have much time, I think we are finally at a very real place where we truly don't have much time. So the positive message to come out of this is to act now, and 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 uh, and as to it support the the message of of this presentation. We we need to start right away. All right, that's it for me. Thank you very much. Well, the picture is not very pretty so far. <laughs> Things are degrading, formats are becoming obsolete, but we might ask ourselves, does it matter? I mean, do we have anything of value that needs to be saved anyhow? <laughs> and if we do, then maybe we better think about value, and we're gonna ask Patrick Feaster to walk us through some ways to think about value. Well, I, I kind of doubt that there's anyone in this particular room who really needs to be convinced of the value of all archival audio, and at least in a general sense. Maybe the value of specific archival audio, but the value of it in general, I, I think, in all likelihood, uh, you wouldn't be here if, if you weren't already convinced of that to some degree. Uh, so for us, spelling out the, the reasons why archival audio is valuable might feel very much like stating the obvious. Uh, but what's perhaps obvious for us isn't obvious to everyone, and uh, our topic here is making the case. So there, there may be some value to talking through uh, some points that we ordinarily take so much for granted that we don't bother to put them into words, just in case we find ourselves having to put them into words. But it's tempting to wax poetical about the value of the type of material we work with, to, to speak about our, our precious audio heritage and how the sounds of the past are going to be lost. Um, these, these arguments have a, a, a good emotional, visceral appeal, uh, but there is some strategic uh, problem with uh, speaking just in terms of things being national treasures and so forth. And if someone's already predisposed to agree with you, Yes, they'll buy into that, but if, um, if not, just saying that something is a treasure won't necessarily be so terribly persuasive. So what I'd like to discuss is how we go about articulating what is it that's distinctively important and valuable about recorded sound collections, or perhaps of time-based media in general, but today I'll be looking and speaking specifically about sound recordings. Uh, for, for some people, and in, in some cases, for some purposes, the value of archival audio as such might not be so distinctive, although it, it might still be very important. And in some contexts, of course, sound recordings are perceived simply as carriers of information that could be expressed just as well and perhaps more conveniently in writing. Um, oral historians often take this position, for example, by treating sound recordings as essentially raw material for transcriptions. So in such cases, the content being assessed for value would be indistinguishable in nature uh, from that in a collection of texts written on paper. Um, at issue would be the words uh, as they could be represented in writing. The recordings themselves 
or the original pieces of paper would have evidential value only. Uh, that is, they might help establish the provenance of the words. Now, from this perspective, uh, they might be quite valuable for their content, too, um, if they haven't yet been transcribed. And in some contexts, that may be precisely the type of value most worth emphasizing. However, we also encounter plenty of value judgments of a very different kind. I'll just quote a few examples by way of illustration from a variety of, of written sources as people who are trying to explain why is it that recorded sound, our recorded sound heritage is so important. First quotation, Andre Millard, America on Record. <clears throat> a sound recording is a piece of historical evidence. It has an impact that goes well beyond the written word or photographic image. Records enable us to listen in on history, to hear it again as it happened. The crash of the airship Hindenburg in New Jersey in 1937 is well preserved on film, but it is the spoken account of the disaster which brings the event to life and stirs the emotions. So, one quotation. Second. Quotation. Representative Karen McCarthy of Missouri stated in a discussion of the National Recording Preservation Act of 2000 that, quote, it is not just music that would be robbed from us if we do not pass this critical legislation. Events from bygone eras have been recorded in sound as well as on paper. These recordings humanize the events we read about in textbooks and transport us to an understanding of our past more comprehensive than any history volume. Third and final quotation, this is from the State of Recorded Sound Preservation in the United States, a number of juicy comments I could have chosen, but here's the one I did. From the mid-1920s until well into the 1950s, radio was the nation's major source for entertainment and news, as well as a mirror of the times. Threatened here is more than the loss of sound recordings, it is the loss of an irreplaceable piece of our sociocultural heritage. Now, statements like these aren't necessarily deeply profound, but they do shed light on what people find valuable, not just about individual sound recordings, but about sound recordings in general, and hence offer clues as to how we might pitch them rhetorically to good effect. Uh, they're supposed to humanize and bring to life events, stir the emotions, transport us, enable us to listen in on history, to hear it again as it happened, having greater impact, uh, giving a more comprehensive understanding than ordinary written sources. And these concepts are all rather vaguely expressed, but they center on this particular experience that recorded sound offers and seem concerned more with vividness of impact than necessarily factual documentation. The, the last quotation further identifies recorded sound itself as a key, quote, piece of our sociocultural heritage and not just as a means of documenting other things. Now, paper documents in an archive might certainly also help to bring events to life or constitute parts of a social cultural heritage, but I find that they're more likely to be valued as sources of factual information about something other than themselves. Well, sound recordings, by contrast, seem to be more likely to be perceived as sources of heightened experience and as objects of interest in their own right. When people contrast archival audio with other archival documents, this is often the first thing they think of when they set about doing that. Then there's also the related matter of what it means to quote an archival item. Traditionally, a researcher would transcribe and quote the words of a given archival paper document and might sometimes include a facsimile or a still photograph when presenting research in print. Research might, they might also transcribe or describe a sound recording in a print publication, but users can, of course, also incorporate audio more directly into what they do or make, for instance, inserting it into radio or TV documentaries, into new creative works, into the classroom, or into conference presentations. Taking advantage of this heightened experience such objects are supposed to offer, whatever exactly that entails. And users' criteria for valuing and choosing material for these purposes may also differ considerably from those they would apply to ordinary textual source materials. Think about what a teacher, conference presenter, or documentary maker might opt to show or play as audio, as opposed to what he or she might opt to read aloud, assign to a class for reading, or show as text on screen. 
And in general, the uses of archival audio content seem less likely to be limited to straightforward research than are the uses of primary written archival source material. And acknowledging and factoring in this diversity of likely uses seems pretty worthwhile if we're to accurately reflect the actual value of collections when making a pitch as to their importance and preservation worthiness. It still is a little abstract. Um, these things are treasures because they offer a heightened experience and so on and so forth. So why is it that they offer this type of experience? I mean, on one hand, it's that they present their material in sound as opposed to visually or through some other sensory mode. Um, they also have this detail, uh, intonation of voice and so forth that you don't have elsewhere. Um, is that important? Uh, well, it, it is if somebody wants to do something with material on that level, uh, to study it, to incorporate it as such into some new work. And so I, I'd like to suggest today that the value of the recording, of recordings in general, can be rep represented quite concretely, if we want to, in terms of what their prospective functions are for both custodians and users now or in the future. And it seems to me that these functions fall into five broad categories, although this typology is very much a work in progress. It, it, you may well be able to think of some others. The first, though, is experiential value. This recording enables someone to have an aesthetically ex uh, heightened experience. This might be compared to the literary value of a text. It's a highly subjective call, but it's, it's one that's nevertheless intuitively powerful. Does listening to an audio recording give the listener goosebumps? Does it transport the listener vividly back in time? And there's research value. A recording enables someone to make a new contribution to knowledge. Uh, the content could involve documented uh, material, a field recording of some, some uh, tradition. Uh, could have to do with the media object itself. It sheds light on how people have changed the way they use sound media over time. But the important thing here is we have some new knowledge that's, that's new in the context of some substantial community. It might be in our, an academic field, not necessarily. Uh, but the emphasis here is on notable discoveries. This audio is contributing more or less directly to them. This can add um, uh, to our existing knowledge, can also uh, do so in a way that uh, draws attention to and enhances the reputation of the holding institution. Um, instructional value. A uh, recording enables someone to convey or acquire existing knowledge. Uh, could involve use in teaching. Also, everyday consultation is a reference source. Um, might not get the same level of attention as certain types of research use, but it could still be quite central to somebody's mission. Um, production value. Recording enables someone to incorporate its content into a new work. Uh, encompasses transcriptions, for example, into a book or article, as well as direct incorporation of audiovisual content, for example, into a radio or TV documentary. So I had that quotation from Karen McCarthy, for example, from the National Recording Preservation Act of 2000. Of course, if I want to publish an article about that, I'll want the transcription. If I'm doing this as a radio piece, it might be very attractive to have the audio of her saying that. Finally, political value. A recording may provide an opportunity to build reputation and goodwill. Individuals with power, economic, administrative, and so forth over an institution may value it for whatever reason. So preserving it and promoting it might win their favor while discarding it or allowing it to deteriorate might alienate them. Uh, this is the odd one out of these five categories and doesn't really address value in quite the same way. It might even be a little bit cynical, uh, but it is still a type of value that may sometimes be worth articulating. These five categories have mutual impacts on one another. Students might create multimedia productions as part of the instructional use of collections. Solid research and instruction uses may have major political payoffs, but the categories I think are, are useful uh, heuristically. One or another of them may be more applicable to a given collection than the others, but I think it's useful to have as a checklist, first of all, just to make sure that as we're pitching a particular collection or sound recording collections in general, we don't miss out one of these potentially attractive features um, that may resonate with a larger mission of an institution or with a granting agency. But uh, just you know, getting back to this issue of doom and gloom and not wanting to seem as though we're, we're always you know, being you know, 
sending a, a downer of a message. I mean, I think that there's very much a, a, an opportunity here to emphasize um, not just the responsibility of preservation, but the opportunities it brings about. Uh, waiting to preserve such material not only uh, risks their loss, but it also deprives people from doing all of these things today. So the longer we wait, the longer we wait for people to get started on all the cool things they could be doing with these materials. Thank you. I want to say just a few words about um, making compelling arguments. And here I'll be drawing upon our experience at Indiana University. So it's very much um, oriented towards an academic institution. These are just a few thoughts. That I'm, I'm sure you can take these and run with them in your own way. And there's many ways to think about these things. And there's many more things that can be brought into this kind of a discussion as well. But here's just a few for us to think about focus. How should we focus our argument? Degradation is pretty easy. We, we have to do it. We have to highlight degradation and obsolescence. But it's not a hard thing to do. We can demonstrate how the content will be lost. We all have examples of delaminating lacquer discs, film in the advanced stages of vinegar syndrome, audio tapes with mold, on and on and on to make very dramatic visual presentations. And we can use those photographs and we can use descriptions to highlight degradation, to highlight obsolescence issues. It's important to do. We have found, however, that it's perhaps in some ways more important to focus on value. That is, as Patrick was just talking about, research and instructional value. Administrators look at the photographs of degradation. They, they read the words about obsolescence and they say, I understand how this works, but why is this important? Are we losing anything? To them, it's not a given that because things are degrading that they're valuable enough to be preserved to justify using resources to preserve them. So focusing our arguments on research value, on what will be lost, why it's important, we have found to be very important and it's something we've tried to do from the very beginning with the, the Media Preservation Survey. One of the things that you can do is try to develop access use cases, that is, how can people use these materials into the future to demonstrate their value, to demonstrate their importance? We can also think about vision. This is, this is you know, pretty obvious, self-explanatory. Try to articulate a vision for the future. Now, understanding that in the past, media objects, media collections have been relatively, well, not even relatively, way underutilized because they simply have not been available in a convenient form. Once items are in, in the digital domain, they are much more accessible and we're much able to find people who can actually use them. And in fact, we see dramatically expanded use when we have digitized objects that are available. So projecting future use, perhaps even future users. Can you interview faculty members who are potential users and talk to them about how they might use these kinds of resources if they had them available? Can you construct user profiles? Can you then tell little stories about the different kinds of use cases that you might have? That can be a very effective way to make an argument. Part of vision for us has been trying to engage our campus prioritization and strategic plans, trying to fit ourselves into where our campus is headed. You can find these kinds of plans at the department level, at the program level, within the library system, the IT system, the, the research if you're in an academic research institution, and trying to fit what you want to do in with those strategic plans so administrators see that what you're proposing helps move the institution forward in the way that they want it to move forward. A good question to ask is, is what I'm proposing, will it help my institution achieve national leadership or, or some kind of leadership? Will it enhance the mission and the stature of my institution? This is the language that 
administrators speak. We can talk about investment, particularly investment being at risk. Well, future investment is obvious. We're, we're proposing you know, that we direct significant resources to preserve these materials, and that may or may not go well. We may, may or may not get the return that we want out of investing the resources in, into this work. But this is perhaps not, certainly not the only way, and perhaps it's not the best way to think about investment. What about past investment? Decades upon decades of investment in collections, services and donors and in communities that many universities have already made. That investment is clearly at risk if action is not taken. We know for certain the content is going to be lost in the coming years. And so this investment essentially goes down the drain if no action is taken. Talk about timing. With any technology or set of technologies, it's important to ask, when do I jump in? When, it, you know, when is it safe to jump in? I would suggest that the early adopter period, what some people call the bleeding edge, for audio is over. It's long over. We're in a very solid place now for audio preservation. I would also add the idea that for video, I think it's, for us, for some institutions, that period is over. For others, it is perhaps a little bit more difficult. For audio, we have file formats, we have standards and best practices, we have lots of experience in place. There's no reason not to be moving forward as quickly as possible with audio preservation at this point in time. With video, we're very close to that. You know, if you were an early adopter in video preservation, to, to talk about uh, ENA, the institution I mentioned in the introduction, they were an early adopter. They started in the late 90s, early 2000s. To do video preservation at that time, you had to go to DigiBeta tape. We had to go to some kind of tape format. They went to DigiBeta. That was the solid strategy at the time. Where that leaves them today is having to migrate those DigiBetas to digital files because the DigiBetas are not going to last forever and that format is also becoming obsolete. That's, that's you know, kind of the downside of the early adopter. Now it's possible to go straight to digital files. We have a couple of possible paths in terms of formats and wrappers that you can justify that are solid enough that we think it's time to invest in video preservation. That really, for us, we think the early adopter period is over. Film is a little less certain at this point in time. And here we have to monitor scanning technology and how that is changing. It's changing very rapidly. Um, we actually think that there is a fairly new product on the market, a scanning technology that um, has resolved some technical issues and has us thinking that we're ready to jump into scanning film. But it is less certain, I think, than audio and video. We have not yet reached, but we are about to reach very shortly, the degradation and obsolescence stage, which is going to be very painful and very expensive, that's fast approaching. So we're in the middle between early adopter and this painful stage, expensive stage at the end, which means that really now is the time to jump in, particularly for audio preservation. And maybe just a quick word about style. I say argue honestly but compellingly. There's no need to exaggerate because the facts are pretty compelling. But we, we need to make them compelling. One thing that, some things that we have found effective is to obviously paint the big picture, you know, the vision part of this, but to make sure you fill that picture in with some details because it's the details that are compelling. It's the specifics of your own collection and of your own problems that help make this real, make this concrete for folks who need to make these kinds of decisions. If you can find stories, people react very positively to stories. They remember stories in the way that they don't remember facts. For us, you know, we stumbled upon a couple of stories that helped, helped us in our publications. One was discovering the lacquer discs abandoned in Franklin Hall, which is not a pretty story, but it certainly is a compelling story. This location accessible only by an attic, piles and piles of important lacquer discs up there. So, so we had a story that we could tell. And even the, um, the two little narratives at the beginning of each of our reports, you know, highlighting the videotape on the desk of our music librarian, 
that was not a story that was presented to us. It's a story that we saw as we were interviewing that particular unit that we kind of teased out and used it to frame and to represent the entire picture that, that, that we were trying to portray. Finding stories can be a very powerful way of making a case. Obviously, photographs and graphics. And of course, somewhat obvious, providing a summary version for busy administrators who are not going to read an entire report or publication. All of this comes with a cost. And that raises some interesting questions. We're going to ask George Blood to come up and talk with us about cost. I find myself presenting at conferences like Chris and Michael very frequently. And I also find myself perpetually doomed to either be first in the morning when everybody's very groggy or immediately after lunch when the carbohydrate coma settles in. So as I set up, I'm going to suggest while I fumble with this for a moment, everyone to stand up and move around a little bit and uh, get the blood circulating a bit while we... Uh, Yeah, I might this is gonna fight me. So I get, I get the bat cleanup. So then I've been addressed to address this question, the one of costs, with some hard numbers about how the costs of preservation digitization are changing. Gesundheit. Quadruplex video is an excellent example of the challenges we face now and will face more and more in more and more formats in the coming years. Quad was the professional format for nearly 25 years. Every television station used this format. James Snyder, the senior systems engineer at the Packard campus of the Library of Congress in Culpeper, tells me there are 130,000 quads in the LC vaults alone. By comparison, the anecdotal number I have is that there are only 100,000 audio cassettes. This is not an esoteric format, a rare form of wire recording or an experimental stereo disc format that uses two tone arms. This was a widely used professional format. Estimates of the number of working machines uh, varies, but uh, it's given as between 100 and 200 machines worldwide. The skills to operate and keep these machines running are in very limited supply. Each of the two gentlemen in this picture have, each have more than 35 years of network broadcast engineering experience. Both are past normal retirement age. And I often think that uh, it might be easier for me to find another woman to stay married to me for 30 years than to replace one of these guys. At a, at a recent uh, a uh, local SAMPTI chapter meeting, someone suggested that if I wanted to find replacements for them, I should use a shovel. <laughs> <laughs> the most critically endangered component is the heads. They last about 500 hours, 
and depend, de depends on the type of heads used and the condition of the tape stock that you're running on the machine. And they need to be replaced every three months. There is one remaining supplier. The work takes three to five days. This is craft work. And it's a lot of fun to get these back because it's clearly that the man who does this really takes great care and pride in his work. But it's not something that somebody's going to learn with a manual over some cold pizza and a couple of beers. Eduardo Zanata, an Argentine immigrant, is the lone remaining artisan in the world. And he is just past 65 years old. And he himself has difficulty getting supplies from ferrite to lapping tape. It has had a predictable impact on the cost. This is Economics 101, supply and demand. And the cost has increased nearly 50% in the four years since I invested in Quad. Moore's Law, this is not. And for those of you who have been not quite going to sleep, that's $5,200 per machine every three months. We have six machines running. Let's take a look at a format more familiar to my ARS colleagues, lacquer discs. We'll assume 16-inch discs to keep the math simple. Let's assume two 15-minute sides, you know, some time to clean, some stylus selection, uh, digitize, equal, you know, check the EQ, digitize, and name the files, about an hour. You know, it's a pretty straightforward task. Um, you can put whatever rate you want on, on the hour, um, our rack rate is $125 an hour. It's $98 an hour in bulk to the federal government according to our GSA contract. This is all public information. You can look it up on the web. That's the wonderful thing about federal government contracting. The one thing about federal right. uh, The internal cost recovery rate at Harvard. That is, if a Harvard department sends a disk to David Ackerman or, or uh, Bruce Gordon to digitize, the rate they charge the other departments is $125 an hour. This is salary, benefits, equipment, rented space, computers, equipment, and software. Their break even point. Again, to keep the math simple, let's assume that you can shop around and get a better rate or a rate in bulk, and we'll call it $100 an hour. Again, you can call this $25 an hour uh, if you want, it won't really affect uh, my arguments here. Most discussions about deterioration are based on images such as this. But media don't go from being like new to catastrophic failure overnight. They deteriorate slowly or quickly over some period of time. Lacquers more quickly than tape, more quickly than shellacs, and so on. One common intermediate mode of deterioration is the leaching of palmitic acid as the plasticizer breaks down and comes to the surface. This long chain fatty acid takes a little work to remove, but it does come off. That is to say, it adds time, but not as much time as trying to recover the disc in the previous image. Let's say it takes 10 or 15 or 25% more time to digitize a disc in this condition. So our $100 per disc is now $125 a disc, or your $25 rate is now $31.25. So uh, in this particular case, I think you'd be disappointed because I'm sure some of my colleagues will recognize that this is a blank side and your money will have been poorly spent. <laughs> I, I think among all of the priorities that we face in trying to set, uh, um, you know, the que answer the question of where do we start, you know, intellectual value or deterioration. I think that digitizing blank objects can be farther down the list. <laughs> uh, as time goes by, the lacquer coating begins to separate from the base, first crazing and alligatoring, uh, or alligating, and then de delaminating. You could probably still play part or even most of this disc, but not all of it. There are pieces missing. This disc is in hospice care. Conferences such as this are full of whiz-bang technologies, discussions of technology that will play a disc like this, extending its playable lifespan. The cognizanti in this room will know immediately that the lovely lady on the left is not Irene, but Kim Peach, who is uh, the web editor for ours, here on a tour of the Packard campus in Culpeper. In front of her is the famous Irene, given life by Carl Haber at, the, at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. 
It uses optical scanning technology to play discs. However, it has a variety of limitations. Uh, not insignificantly is that it doesn't sound as good as putting a stylus in a groove. Since it is far from commercialization, we can only guess at its final cost, if indeed it is ever available. I'm told that the camera alone costs $150,000. The entire kit is lab grade, high precision components. $250,000 for that toy is not an extravagant number, but let's say it gets commercialized, and, but even at $100,000, this is not going to be purchased by many in-house digitization studios trying to scrape up $250 for an A to D converter to use with Audacity. In preparation for this talk, I called Peter Allier who oversees Irene at LC. He explained to me that uh, Carl Haber and his team have built software to reconstruct broken discs. If the brake is clean, the edges uh, of the brake aren't missing too much material. And scanning the discs is followed by a very manual RSI-inducing process of aligning the grooves between the pieces. And it takes about five hours of human time, plus, plus the post-processing time by the computer. In the last few slides, the cost of digitizing a disk over some indefinite period of time has gone from $100 to $125 to $500 for one disk, plus the cost of amortizing the cost of this toy that we'd all like to play with. Let's look at this in quantity, though. If we were to amortize those costs over a larger number of disks, we see that the cost of delaying digitization are still very, very large and not decreasing with time. So a thousand discs at $100 an hour is $100,000 at $125 an hour to get, or for, per disc to get the palmitic acid off. And then you add the cost of irene in there and the cost of doing discs is getting to be very expensive. Technological solutions to obsolescence and deterioration cannot be expected to make future costs lower. And around these numbers again, for those of you who can get this done for $25 an hour, you still see the cost is not insignificant over time. I jotted down a list of some of the expenses bearing down on the cost of providing digitization services, costs which you will face sooner or later, whether you do the work in-house or send them out to vendors. These examples aren't fear-mongering, if we're not at the end of the beginning, we are certainly at the beginning of the end. And there are cases where there are no solutions. We can all dream about supply and demand stepping in, that at some price, someone will decide there's a market niche and make replacement parts and solutions at some who can afford that price such as Irene. Out in the real world, that is not proving to be the case. There are formats which are, uh, which are uh, completely extinct. Not even the resources of the US federal government and the need to save 130,000 quad tapes has enabled the Library of Congress to find a supplier to manufacture new replacement quad head assemblies to be used when the existing stock can no longer be refurbished nor will those amazingly large resources keep Eduardo Zanata or my video engineering staff alive forever. Done? <laughs> Let's have a conversation. First, I want to recognize Dennis Rooney, a member of the technical committee who led us down this path towards this topic this year. Thanks to Dennis for thinking about that. And second, I want to point out that there are other members of the technical committee, some of which have much expertise in the nitty gritty of obsolescence and degradation. And I want to see if any of them have comments that they would like to make. Seth, in particular, I've asked to Respond. Let's let's give him the mobile microphone, and we'll just pass this along. So we'll 
We'll have a, a, a brief bit of comments from TC members, and then we're going to open thing, the thing up to questions from you. We've spoken here about a lot of doom and gloom, but in a way, we should all be proud of ourselves in the amount that we've saved up to this point. You know, when you see the number of figures from different institutions on all these obsolete formats, you have to come to a realization, maybe we're not going to get to all of this in our lifetime. And my feeling is, is that when you hire somebody or hire a vendor, Make sure that person is somebody who is an expert within what you want them to do. And then also make an evaluation of what you think is the most important thing for your archive. What, what did you collect in your archive that you want to promote? And then make those decisions. And another thing that I've found dealing in this business is that when things are sent out for digitization, there should be some sort of quality check by the customer when it comes back from the institution. People pull up service copies, see how do they sound, have some expert even listen to the original sound file and see if there's a proper integrity that has come back because you may have ordered something and something goes down the road for about four or five years. Then all of a sudden someone comes back and says, you know, something doesn't sound right with these and there's a uniform problem. My feeling has always been that better not to touch something and not preserve it if you don't know what you're doing with it, rather than trying to preserve it, and then you get back something that may have destroyed it in the process. I know people have come to me, and they've asked me about X, Y, and Z, or something in video. I will not touch video. I won't touch certain audio um, formats. I have people I know that I will send it to. I have a list of people. I said, this person will be able to do dictaphone belts, timing belts, that kind of thing. So as a, fr a late friend of mine used to say, uh, uh, shoemaker, know thy last. Know what you're an expert in. And also, if you're outsourcing material, whatever vendor you're going to, make sure that that vendor is actually handling it and not outsourcing it to some other place. Notice that they, they are actually handling the material. Because I've heard of certain places where, in the past, that they didn't know what they were doing, they sent it to somebody. If the vendor does that, they should be upfront and say, look, I can't handle this, I'm going to send this. I, I can either send it somewhere, or I can suggest somebody who is an expert. Another thing is that when you are sending material out, call other institutions for referrals. How did this vendor treat you? What was your experience? This is something why the people on the technical committee, the people represented, are in business for that. Each one of them has their own expertise and has gone down this road. But the other thing is too, Remember, we may not be able to get to all of this. We never realized that there was so much of this instantaneous live material done. It was never meant to last this long. We're lucky that we can pull up now a 75-year-old lacquer, and many of them are still retrievable. Tape from now 60 years ago that's been having problems. Another thing I would strongly suggest, if you're dealing with tape material, especially acetate, if you can't get to it all now for uh, migration, have an expert work on it and do some conservation on it so it is ready to roll for preservation. Acetate tape, I found in many ways, is one of the biggest morasses ever, ever foisted on the market in the sense of the age, its instability, its characteristics, that there are things that need to be prepped with it before it can be uh, properly digitized. Otherwise, you're going to have major problems with it. And we all know about splicing tape. And you have to know when those splicing, splicing tape is used and at what time and what char characteristic problems you will hit. So you need to find people who are experts in these things. And I would also strongly suggest, as I did last night, we have to start coming up with some sort of videos for instruction for future generations of those who are going to be working in institutions on how to handle and respect this material and understanding certain things that when you are dubbing it, to understand that when you're playing a tape or a disc, how do you determine what the correct playback speed is? Is it on pitch? Is it off pitch? 
because there are problems that when you manipulate it digitally, if you didn't get it right, you lose an awful lot of bits at the upper end of the audio spectrum. That if you do it at a low sampling rate, you are starting to eat into the audio range when you want to correct it. So don't think it's all the gloom. Look up on your shelves of what you already have there that is accessible that people can listen to and, come and, uh, and enjoy. And my feeling is, is that maybe there should be a campaign from a lot of these institutions to talk to a lot of the patrons who have influence to talk to the local congressman about saying, how about some bills allocating funds to start doing this for us? That's what our politicians in Washington and in your state capitals are there for, to get the money to start rolling things. The institutions, the librarians, the administrators have to take that initiative because the money just doesn't open up on July 1st magically. You have to go after it and explain why it's so important. Especially if it's a politician sometimes who wants to get reelected and it's an election year, which happens in certain states every four years, but it, it can rotate depending on uh, what the representative is. So that's all I have to say. It's just find the expert that you know and what you're looking for and what your priority is. You know, you can have glass-based discs, which I think are the most fragile of all the lacquer discs done during the war, but if the material on it is of commercials for some local soap manufacturer, you've got to think about that and say, well, I have some in-house concerts here that are on aluminum discs that are not in as bad shape, but those are more important. You have to, you know, decide what is your priority in your collection. So that's all I have to say. Right, thanks, Seth. Let's, um, okay. Let's segue into questions from you all. Does anybody have any questions? George, I see one back in the back. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, this is actually, a, in a sense, an ignorant question. I really don't know the answer, and I don't, thank you. I don't really know whether you do either, but you raised the point, and so, yeah, sorry. So I, I wanted to ask you, is there a way to, in a country that works basically on the concept of capitalism, there's a clear demand for obsolete formats. Admittedly, it's not huge, but when you're talking about the two-inch videotape, it's actually pretty large. And you, you use the example that the United States government can't, in effect, create a new factory, or at least find the, use their funds to create a new factory. And so my, my question really is, is it possible to create an organization that can pursue, or in effect, the equivalent of orphan drugs. What's, what, what makes it impossible to have an orphan technologies um, organization that makes such a thing? Now, obviously, there has to be a person who wants to do that, and it's not going to be me. And I suspect it's not going to be you either. What I'm asking is, is this something that's completely absurd, or is there such a possibility of creating a company that will remanufacture seven, the 7,000 series of the Sony DAT machine or two-inch machines and their head assemblies or something like that. It doesn't strike me as theoretically impossible if the documentation still exists. I think it's less a question of whether it's possible than what it would cost. One of the examples I had up there was uh, germane to the, the work on uh, video heads, which is the uh, that there's no longer a supplier of lapping tape. It's what's in the drawers or it's right. gone. And it was made by uh, a Scotch. You know, 3M would make more of this tape. But they have to set up the, the, the okay. they've got all the specifications, and they're going to charge you $40,000 to make one roll of tape. I mean, you could have, you could want 1,000 tapes, but we probably only need 100 rolls of the, before all the, the, the videotape is done. Um, but it's that kind of problem. and. It's a basic market issue that you know we can talk about. Somebody ought to do this, but you know, could, could all of us get together? And I mean, since I've known Seth, he's been talking about doing consortial buys. And uh, as you know, Chris challenged us. We've all talked about doing these things, and what have we done? But, but actually, the idea that I had was, if we go, to, if we go to the government and we tell them about the copyright issues that we've been having, which is what we've been doing, and we've been saying to them, we need to change the copyright. And some movement, small though it may be, is being made on that after 25 years or 30 years of trying. 
why is it so impossible to set up such a committee or to at least contact the United States government to say set up such a committee for uh, obsolescence of important historical equipment? I mean, it, strike, it, it just doesn't strike me that, I guess what I'm saying is that everything I'm hearing is this is too expensive to do, so we can't do it. Why? Why is it that we can't pursue a government agency and say, look into this, into an organization that can do this? You know, forty thousand dollars is not a lot of money for the United States government. It simply is. That's right. Um, just roll the presidents. Just roll the presidents. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be flipped. No, I just thought that it was. Yeah. I was being flipped, but <laughs> but but let me. Um, I, I, I'm Bob Hyper from Chase Audio, and I had the privilege of uh, helping out on the National Recording uh, Sound Preservation Plan, and and talking with a number of very smart people. And uh, really, it's time to think outside the box uh, on technology. Okay, the goal, and really, to me, I think one of the interesting things we came up with is, it's not about creating the original equipment that created these tapes, but really about creating new technologies to recover these media that are more efficient and make it a much more efficient process so that you can do stuff, I mean, like we have some audio cassettes, mass digitization material, and there are debatable issues about that, but it's still basically the same technology. The real trick, and you're right, it's a business. There is a business opportunity. I'm a business guy, and if I could see where the R&D would come off to pay off, to transfer all 130,000 of those tapes for the Library of Congress at 10 minutes per tape because I have some kind of fast scanning technology, hey, that would be a great business. So really, this is where technology has to take us. Stop thinking about remaking all this old equipment. It's lived its useful life. We have to have better efficiencies because you're never going to afford to do this stuff in the one-to-one -one environment. The labor cost alone makes it really an impossible situation. I would, I would just add that, that again, I think we, and I've gotten caught in the same trap, I always want to do the same thing, which is to think about that type of scenario where we build this thing. But we have to remember that you build the thing, you have to have an infrastructure to support the thing, to maintain it for parts, supplies, all these various things. So it's not just one investment in one thing, you actually have to like have an entire infrastructure to support that over a period of time. And I think that's much more complex than just building a single, single device. I've got a general comment uh, related to a lot what Mike brought up. Uh, when you're trying to solve a technical problem, it's like anything else in the world. You have to look at what is the root uh, problem to, that you have to deal with to begin with. It's called money. And what I think is done very poorly at this point, when you look at it, uh, Indiana as an example, it's a shining star right now. There is no question about it. But I don't see an, another shining star in the academic environment. And my own personal attitude is that we've done a very, uh, we're in a very difficult path to try to educate the people who control budgets. It's always been that case. Uh, you have essentially media materials that were literally looked upon as second uh, class citizens, so to speak, in the intellectual world of academia. And to try to get libraries as an advocate for putting their budget money into media is, uh, it has in the past been a joke. Uh, Indiana, when you start pointing out that as an example, you go, wow, it's still the exception to the rule. And I think what you have to do if you're going to solve a problem, you've got to put together a game plan that you gave a nice general outline, but you really have to come together as a group and educate the library if you're under that domain, and most, most archives are, which I think, frankly, is a mistake. Uh, and one of the reasons I say I think it's a mistake is uh, something we have discussed. The cost of cataloging the information, and the people alone, and information, things literally can become over catalog. They could, there could be way too much metadata, and when you want to start, the cost I didn't see George put up is those types of costs. When you start factoring in those types of costs, you don't have the money left to take care of putting out this fire. So I, I guess what I'm saying is I'd like to hear what your comments or anybody else in the office, in, in the audience, including 
people in the library world, which I've worked in, uh, how do you deal with the politics? Because the politics is what's killing this process more than the obsolescence of the technology. Just one side comment from my perspective. I think the tide is starting to turn a bit, not just at our institution, but some others. I'm seeing libraries and other universities now beginning to hire audiovisual conservators, media preservation specialists. There's been a number of these that have come down the line recently. So resources are starting to be directed towards them. And I also think that um, amongst faculty, that there's more of a recognition that media can provide important primary scholarly resources. I think that tide has turned as well. So that's hopefully a positive note. Yes, yeah, small, I know. But I'd love to hear other comments on what Bill had to say. Well, regarding that, I'm sort of the oddball out. I'm Tom Walker. I'm the Music and Digital Services Librarian at Marshall University in Huntington, West Virginia, the second poorest state in the country. The problem that we have, I'm a librarian by trade, but I'm an, I love recorded sound. I'm an audio geek, have been for many, many years. The biggest problem that I seem to have is my library falls under IT. We're not libraries working with IT. IT controls our budget. So I deal with a bunch of tech geeks and a bunch of number crunchers. And when I try to say we need to preserve this based on standards developed by AES, by IAZA, I get looked at by an IT administrator and says, that's not the right way to do it. There's better ways out there. And I say, these are audio professionals. They're telling me this is the way we do things. We should do it this way. Well, we're just not going to do it. So I've got a collection that is basically sitting on a shelf. I can't do anything with. It's rotting as we speak. The only thing I can preserve are the ones that were born digital to start off with, because I can easily load those up on my machine and put them onto a server and onto separate hard drives that I've purchased myself. All of my reel to reels that go back to 1950, they're just sitting, thankfully not next to the heater anymore, <laughs> but they're in a closet upstairs above the uh, music building. How on earth do you convince these people, especially you, Mike, because I know I try to use you guys at Indiana and North Texas as an example on how the music department, the library, and everybody's working together to preserve these recordings. How on earth are you guys doing it? I mean... Yeah, that's a great question. We're, we're fighting some battles with our IT organization right now, so we've not... It's, we're not exactly in the clear. But we have had um, serious buy-in from our IT folks. UITS is our IT organization, and they've supported our planning efforts financially to a pretty high tune, I would, I would say. So there has been some buy-in, but there has been quite a bit of education that has needed to be done. And it hasn't come, it, it's come from us, but it's gone through people beyond, you know, higher than me. I, I have to engage people who, are, who have ties to upper administration to make those kinds of points. I can't make them directly. So fostering the relationships up the chain is, is what has worked for us and what probably needs to happen. I don't have any great answers for your situation. Is it time? Okay. Okay, I think we have reached our time. Thank you all for coming, and we'll continue the discussion in the hallway if you want.